Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm going to be joined in a second by Tom as well from Couchbase. We're going to try and take you through uh, a bit of kind of an overview of why containers, a bit of how this new operator framework fits together, and then we're going to show you a demo. We actually have the demo upstairs working live on the booth. Um, I don't trust conference Wi-Fi, so I've uh, recorded the demo for now. So, um, but if you want to see it live working upstairs, it is up there, so I promise you can come and see it. So um, you heard this morning, you had Martin up on stage talking a bit about containers. So the first thing really to say about containers, containers are a technology, but the real kind of thing about containers, which I'm finding so exciting and the reason there's so much buzz around them in the industry, is the speed of application delivery. So the scenario we're going to walk you through with our demo in a bit is me as someone who's never installed Couchbase before, which was true until last week with the operator, I've been asked to test the latest version of the beta code, and I've been asked to do an automated failover test to see whether this Couchbase um, with my application will survive and how my application will actually behave. So how easy stroke hard is that to happen at the moment? We all remember the days where we had to go off, we'd get a new piece of software, we'd get an install guide, it would then have its own form of clustering when we moved it into production. Everything was delivered, designed, operated, run, recovered, failure. All these components were all kind of unique to the individual applications. Containers are this kind of unified way of delivering, deploying, running, and automating. And that's the real key. And you can take that up. And from our point of view, you know, we're engineering everything on top of Red Hat Enterprise Linux. So in the bottom one, everywhere we can run Red Hat Enterprise Linux, we can give you that same kind of end-to-end -end support and scalability and reliability that you'd come to build your data platform on. Just some interesting kind of anecdotes. I've been working with some big customers using the OpenShift container platform. We did a study of some of them, but to give you some, you know, this is happening with some of my customers here in London. I asked one of my customers, you know, on the, you know, return on investment, how many containers are we running at the, you know, what's our most dense container deployments? And on, you know, small virtual machines, 16 CPU, um, a bit of memory, can't even remember how much. But I asked them, how, what's the biggest container density we're running today at the moment? And we found out we've got nodes which are running up 160 containers today. So think about your virtualization, think about how you're running cloud systems, how you're running on-premise systems. Think about, you know, that's where some of these numbers are. Also, there's the kind of you know, speed to market. If you want to spin up a couch-based cluster, you want to test something very quickly, how long does it take that to happen? In the demo you're going to see, we're going to spin up a couch-based cluster in the space of minutes. So one of my customers who's building everything on containers and working towards containers, their slogan is ideas to production safely in a day. That whole idea is that you come up with an idea, you want to get that running on Couchbase, you want to code in the morning, you want to get your application tested up and running, and then you throw it away if it's no good. But it's only when it's that fast that it becomes that reliable. So this is where, this is why containers are so interesting, because they transform the way we do business. The technology is great, but the actual business and how they enable us to react and respond to these digital transformation kind of themes is, is the real key. So um, that's kind of a quick overview of containers. Um, the transformation across all of these kind of different deployment, development, and uh, runtime footprints is the key to us. And I just wanted to briefly just position where OpenShift, because that's the Red Hat offering in this space, where that fits into the space. So in the middle I've drawn you know, my big Kubernetes, seven-sided shape. Kubernetes, you know, the, the person driving the ship, person steering everything. So in, you know, this container kind of, I, I guess, metaphor, if we have our application packaged as the container, our Kubernetes runtime is the ships that are kind of sailing around the world, and we're now going to introduce the operator. These are like the ports, the things that know how to actually load and unload applications from these containers. So, Looking at this kind of picture, I've tried to draw it, and it makes sense in my mind. I probably need to talk it through, I'm afraid, because I'm on the technical side, and art was never my strong point. So we've got Kubernetes in the middle. Kubernetes is the orchestration layer. To make sense of Kubernetes, though, 
With Kubernetes, you also need things like registries, you need to do logging, you need to do metrics, you need to have ways to do deployments, you need to upgrade the platform, you need to have a life cycle. So at the top, we've got this um, enterprise life cycle. So we build everything on top of enterprise Linux. So that's got our kind of 10 year life cycle with the operating system. And we couple that to the container platform and also package all of these other open source projects together into an enterprise fully tested, fully managed, fully life cycled distribution of Kubernetes, almost like Kubernetes plus plus that you can take and you can rely on and you can build your applications on. We also have a number of developer experience tools in there as well. So if you want to use it to deploy and develop other applications and the complete stack, we've got tools in there to enable you to give it to your developers so they can just you know, run a single command and they can bring up a full application stack in there. And at the bottom here, we've just acquired a company called CoreOS. And CoreOS is the company that's actually come up with the Kubernetes operator. CoreOS is a really interesting company because they have focused purely down in this operations experience down here. Their view is there's something like 3.4 billion users on the internet out there, and there's about 28 million IT professionals, depending on which server you look at. Um, so we're outnumbered. So if we try and look after things manually, we are going to fail. So we've set the idea of where containers are really interesting. Containers are the things that are actually going to deliver the components. And we've said we're outnumbered, so we need to automate the, the, how we're going to actually um, run and, and operate things. And that's where the operator framework comes in. Ah, the clicker of doom. Right, so here we are. So we're an enterprise pattern here. So if this is familiar to anyone in the organization, so we've got a new project, we've got something new, we'd like to do a quick bit of uh, investigation. So we're going to try and get a new Couchbase server stood up. Well, in large organizations, probably there's a centralized team that's running the Couchbase service. So uh, the developer team goes, well, they're too difficult to talk to. So I'll just hack something together by reading some documentation that I found on GitHub and hope that everything works. So we get left with all these technical get it done and we get these technical debt building in the organization. The next level of maturity was we said, well, we need a centralized team to look after the Couchbase service. So the centralized team will look after all the Couchbase servers. But now your application team say, I want to try something. Can I just have a new? Sorry, you can't come to the new, can't, because our backlog of work in this centralized team. What we want to get to is the right-hand side. We want to get to, it's the right-hand side down here and up there. They're just checking. We want to get to the right-hand side where we take the, this kind of SRE thinking, the site reliability, re site reliability engineer thinking. We say, how do we get something where, you know, the site reliability engineer's thinking is, if we do something once, we fix it manually. If we do it twice, we automate it. What we should be doing is everything we aim to do, we should have automated and it should happen by, you know, autonomously by the program itself. And that's where the idea of the operator is born. So on the top here, You've got a, a user coming along, standing up an application. OC is the OpenShift command line. New app is one of these developer tooling. You say, go and look at this GitHub repo, spin up that Java code, package it with the JDK, bring in a Couchbase database, link them all together, everything's all hunky-dory. But that's got the application running. Who's gonna look after it in 10, 20, 30 days, 120 days, two years time? Wouldn't it be great if there was a My Tasks app, an operator that would actually look up for indexing backup, defragmentation, recycling, uh, in-place upgrades, all of these other components that we have to do manually or we have to like schedule in and have teams to do. And that's where the OpenShift operator framework comes in. Now, I'm going to be joined up on stage by Tom, who's going to talk us a bit through more detail about the actual Couchbase components, and then we're going to show a quick demo. Thanks, Chris. So I'm one of our solutions architects here at Couchbase. I've been at the company four or five years. I can see there's a, a few people out there from customers who might recognize me from on-site. Um, I'm really glad that we're able to share the space today here with Red Hat, particularly that we're able to talk about the, the OpenShift platform. Couchbase starts, first started to look and work with the OpenShift platform around, I think it was about two and a half, three years ago. 
And the initial kind of ask came from a couple of our customers. In fact, it was a couple of our largest customers here in EMEA rather in the, than in the US. And they were coming to us saying, we need you to support OpenShift. Couchbase, you need to support OpenShift. And we were kind of going back to them saying, well, you know, we support Red Hat Enterprise Linux. We support Windows. We support AWS. We support Azure. Do, do you really need another platform for us to support? But, you know, they, they were big, important customers for us. So, you know, we did the due diligence. We worked through that. And we started to bring um, support for OpenShift on board as something they could utilize. And as part of that, the more that we looked into the OpenShift platform, the more we started to see why those very large-scale customers were coming to us and asking for us to support it. And then, as time has gone on, and particularly in the last 12 months, as the OpenShift platform has evolved and developed with this new operator functionality, that's enabled us to do a number of things that we have wanted as part of our database technology offering for a very long time, but which we simply haven't been able to find this kind of platform agnostic solution that enabled us um, to achieve. So since the introduction of the operator, we've been working very hard in, with our engineering team, closely with Red Hat, closely with the Kubernetes teams, for developing this operation, operator. And what it allows you to do is to run these stateful, business-critical applica applications that need to manage data locally at high performance and high speed, but allow it to be cross-cloud so you can have the portability across different environments, to be fully automated, with all operational best practices applied out of the box and to have elastic scaling with push button dynamic scalability. And, and as I say, when we started to look into OpenShift more and more as part of that initial requirement that came to us, we started to realize that because the couch base had been designed from the ground up with this multi-dimensional scaling in mind, so the individual components of the database could be split into services and scaled independently of each other. These were ideally suited to be run on a container platform. And they're ideally suited to something like OpenShift, where you want that scaling to be dynamic and controlled for you automatically. So when we start to look at some of the actual requirements that people um, have for these kind of databases, we say, OK, what are we looking for here? Well, we want auto-provisioning. And many of the customers I work with who are on various cloud platforms, who are on their own in-house systems, they have their DevOps team. The DevOps team take Couchbase's APIs, they take AWS's APIs or Azure's APIs, and that DevOps team start to write code. It can create a Couchbase cluster. It can add some machines in. It can try to work out what's going on. It can also try to do some scaling when they see a bigger increase in capacity demand. But that's all code that DevOps team has had to write themselves. What the operator is, is providing is a framework where Couchbase can write that code. And by it being Couchbase that writes that code, it means we also test that code and we support that code. So rather than the customer having to manage and worry about that, it's something that we can provide to them and they can receive full support for just like they can with the rest of the product. Obviously, that frees up more time for people to focus on actual application development and other important tasks around application deployment. The other kinds of requirements we see coming up are things like geo-distribution. We don't just want our data local in one data center. We need this data to be available anywhere in the world, and we need strict control over which data goes to which location, and we need it there as fast as possible. And this, this kind of plays into two requirements. One is from the idea that we want our data local to the users. We don't want our users going all the way around the world to a data center in the US just to retrieve a data because they're in, the, in Europe, they need to access that data locally to give them the best possible performance, the lowest latency. So you need this geo-distribution of data. Coupled with that, of course, is the high availability aspect of that. If you lose a data center, if you lose one region, if you lose access to an Amazon or an AWS in Dublin or Frankfurt, you still want your applications to stay up and stay available. And to do that, of course, you have to have the data available. In terms of management of the system, there's obviously a, a desire that you have a central point of control that you can manage all of these systems, that it gives you configuration and a way to control um, new growth, new development requirements, and all that staged process between development, uh, UAT, pre-production, staging, through to final production deployments. And you want a single point of contact to be able to take care of that for you. And finally, um, auto-recovery. When a machine fails, when a machine goes down, when incidents happen, as they always do, you want the system to take care as much of that for you as possible. 
you really ideally want your on-call SMS and phone, if it's going to ring, to be ringing to tell you that the system's already solved the problem for you and you don't need to do anything until the next day. So that auto recovery is, is a key aspect. But when you look at you know, all of these different kinds of requirements and you, and you take them in aggregate, what we're really saying is that these are the requirements that you need if you want a database that is cloud native. If you're looking for a database that has been designed from the ground up to be run, on managed, run and managed on cloud platforms, it needs to be very different to a traditional database. And these are the core kind of things that you need to have those capabilities. Now, some of those things are things that we've worked with for a long time, like geo-distribution of data. Some of those things are particularly difficult. Auto-provisioning, it very much kind of lives outside of Couchbase because you want to create Couchbase clusters, you want to manage them. And it's kind of difficult to find where the home for that was. But the operator and the OpenShift platform really give us the home that that code we can provide can live and power the rest of the features. And one of the huge benefits is now that you don't have to be tied into a single cloud vendor. By having OpenShift as that cloud agnostic layer that can run in-house, Azure, AWS, GCE, and many other platforms, we're only coupled into the OpenShift layer, and regardless where you want to deploy the technology, you can continue to use the operator, continue to write your applications to work with Couchbase, and seamlessly shift them between the locations. So Chris, do you want to talk a little bit about the, uh, the operator itself and some of the functionality they can provide? Yeah, sure, thank you. So this is the, um, the link to the Couchbase operator, and these are the automated components um, that are available out of the box today. It's worth saying that we're still in beta at the moment. Beta till just a little bit later in the summer. Yes, so expect this list of you know, components that are automated for you out of the box just to get longer and longer. So um, this is uh, an OpenShift cluster that I uh, installed. And in here, it's not very exciting to start with. All I'm showing you is within my namespace, so at the top right hand side, uh, of course it just changes the screen, at the top right-hand side there, I'm limited to a namespace. So this OpenShift cluster actually has about 15, 20 different users, all in different namespaces. None of them can see what I'm doing in here. It's all role-based access control. So what I've given is this user here, uh, myself. I've given myself a pod which is running the Couchbase operator. Now the Couchbase operator is a piece of code which itself is delivered as a container. Now you don't need to worry about the operator um, uh, failing or dying or anything like that. Because it's part of the platform, the platform will actually monitor and restart the operator itself as well. Then there's a bit of configuration. Um, to be honest, that's YAML. It's pretty horrible to read. But on the right-hand side, I was asked to go off and test the 5.5 beta. And the 5.5 beta, I'm told, does auto recovery if it loses a node and it'll automatically um, what's the correct, converge the cluster. So um, let's change that. So what I did was I went into this, this is supplied, and I changed that enterprise 5.0.1 to be beta 5.5. And I wanna do a failure test, so I need to have at least three nodes, I'd say, to do my replication. So I changed that to three, and I changed that to the beta 5.5 code. I then threw this configuration file at the Couchbase operator and said to the Couchbase operator, go and do, go and configure me automatically a Couchbase cluster. And I'm gonna ask Tom to talk through the next bits of what you're actually gonna see on screen as it actually happens. Cheers, thank you. And um, a, little while, a little while ago, about two months back, I was visiting one of our customers and um, there's somebody who's speaking today, the customer actually, and they, were, they, they kind of said to me, we have this goal, we have this aim to have this side of infrastructure as code. And although I didn't admit it at the time, I wasn't cre really quite sure what they meant by that. And I kind of had a light bulb moment when I, I first got a copy of these slides from Chris. And I saw this definition here, this, this simple configuration file that fully defined what infrastructure they want to have deployed and how it could all be automated without them having to do any of it manually. And it was kind of a light bulb moment for me that instead of going there and creating and destroying these things manually or scheduling project tasks to do it, it was just a case of creating a configuration file that defined what you wanted and how it should be deployed. So what we have here is a little animation, a video showing us that we have that operator deployed there. We've sent that configuration file to the operator. 
the operator takes that on board, passes it, processes it, and it's now going to create as the Couchbase cluster as defined in that file. So what we can see here is it has now created the first container for us. So this is a container running Couchbase, pre-installed. It's pre-configured with all of our best practices. So the best practices for operating system tuning, the best practices for security, they're all pre-baked and applied, so it's another thing that you don't have to worry about. Once it's created that first container, Couchbase deployed into it, it's then going to go ahead and it's actually going to create the additional containers that make up the full cluster. So the second container gets deployed. It's added into the Couchbase cluster automatically. You don't have to use any APIs. You don't have to start going into our web console and clicking to add servers into the cluster. All managed automatically behind the scenes. We're doing our rebalance. We're growing that cluster on demand. And then finally, it's going to bring in the final node piece by piece as each one of these is created and brought together. So I'll just give that a couple seconds for the final one to come up. And there we can see the final containers being created and added into the cluster. So that then gives us our full cluster of couch base. It's up and running, ready to use. Application teams can start developing against it. So once we have that, I might need to click again. Click again. Once we have that deployed, you know, it's quite common, particularly in development and test environments, that people actually want to have um, test scenarios. We want to simulate a machine failing because we want to ensure that if a Couchbase database server fails because of a power outage or similar, that our application can still keep running. So you can see there we had our three nodes of Couchbase. We're going to delete one of those containers. We're going to just pull the rug under it as if the power had gone off. So that container is now gone and dropped out of the Couchbase cluster. We can see in the UI that that node is showing as unresponsive. It's unavailable. So far, this is completely exactly how Couchbase would work in any other platform. We wait for a period of time. In this demo, we've set it for 30 seconds so you can see what's going on, but you can set that as low as five seconds. After that period, it will what we call fail over that node. So after five seconds, that node will ensure that the spare copies of the data become available. So after five seconds, the application keeps on running. It's keep going. The uh, end users can service their requests. It's just we're running at slightly less capacity. So we have two servers currently in the cluster. So slightly less than we would normally have, but we're still up and running. This is kind of the point normally where your on-call would be going. Somebody would be working out, oh, do we need to add a new machine back into the cluster? What happens if a second machine fails? But with the operator, we can see a new node has appeared. So the operator has automatically detected the fact that that machine had failed. It's created a new container for us. It's deployed it onto some of the hardware that is already available within that OpenShift environment. It's added it into the cluster, and it's gone ahead and triggered the rebalance. So not only have we made the data available in that five-second period, the operator is then kicked in to ensure that we get back to full capacity so that we're fully protected from any peaks in traffic for performance, and if there's any additional failures, we're fully there and available with additional spare copies of the data. So that was all live in, in, in real time that that was recorded. And you can see there that the rebalance took virtually no time at all. And we're back to a full capacity cluster, exactly like we were before. So the power of the operator here is that it's taking many of the ev everyday tasks that administrators have to do when they're managing a technology like Couchbase. And it's deploying them for you in a way that's tested and supported by Couchbase and with all of our best practices around security and performance pre-applied so that you can use it agnostically across many of the different cloud platforms. So I'm going to hand back to Chris just to briefly wrap up on Yeah, thank you. And some of that. Um, the, the demo and everything, I, I did it on a fresh cluster. So the cluster was actually running on an enterprise virtualization platform or on Rev. Um, so you can even speed that up as well, because I hadn't pulled the Couchbase cluster, uh, uh, Couchbase pod, and pre-warmed any of the nodes. So that was all actually live, real-time cluster had never had Couchbase run on it before. Um, if you want to see it so we can prove that it all just works, we've got it all set upstairs um, on the Red Hat stand, so you can come up and speak to one of the, myself or one of my colleagues on the booth, and we can show that to you as well. So just to kind of summarize, you know, the really interesting thing for me about containers is it enables this different way of operating as, as um, a business and how you kind of, you know, everyone's talking about DevOps and fast fail and how do we get stuff running quickly. You saw how quick and easy it was to say to someone, here's a bit of infrastructure as code, here's an operator, can you go and run um, Couchbase images? 
I told you it's namespace, role-based access control, so you can give different users their own versions and their own couch base clusters, and you can have people developing as fast or as slow as they want to develop. They're all free to stand up and destroy their own clusters, test them, break them, do what they want to do. So what we're trying to deliver is basically extending, you know, today, we, we kind of, I guess, the cloud providers, those are, I guess, the gold standard and, and the way people think about how they go off and they consume services. Everything is a service. We're trying to take, with the operator framework and the OpenShift platform, we're trying to give you that flexibility to say, actually, hey, would you like that level of automation, that aut autonomy? Would you like that level of, um, you know, the platform running itself and also the applications on top of it? And would you like to choose and run that wherever you want to, be that on public cloud, private cloud, traditional enterprise virtualization, or even on physical machines. Um, we hope open up that choice with everything. Um, hopefully it's been useful, and it's added the next level of detail to the operator framework and also to containers. Um, if there's, I don't know if we're doing questions. Yep, we've got some three, three minutes left, so we can take a couple of questions if anyone's got anything. I cannot see if anyone's even, oh, look at that. Oh, that's great. <laughs> We're not going to hold it long because we're going to go and yeah. have some cocktails because I'm here there coming soon. No. If no questions, we'll say thank you very much for your time and um, hope it was useful. Thank you. Cheers, everyone. Thanks very much. <laughs>